Welcome to the uh, Asthma Community of Practice session for November. Uh, this, Thank you all for joining. Today we're going to focus on reducing household allergens and triggers for asthma and we have a couple of great speakers that I'm really looking forward to um, with regards to that. Before we go any further, I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. So uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. And for me today, that's the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to the elders past, present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people today, for they are the safekeepers of memories and traditions and culture. We recognise their connection to country, land, sea, and community, and the role in caring for and maintaining country over thousands of years. May their strength and wisdom be with us today. And I think it's also important to reflect that we know that asthma disproportionately affects people from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background. It's one of the many health disparities, so uh, even more reason for us as a community to work to try to tackle that. So just some housekeeping before we launch into the meeting. Um, so it, I think everyone's done a lot of this already, but it would be great if you can stay on mute. Um, we will be monitoring the chat, so please post your questions in that. We are recording the session so that people who can't make it can view it. And please ensure that your, um, your Zoom name is the name that you registered with so that we can mark your attendance for your uh, continuing professional development uh, certificate. And in terms of how to change your name in Zoom, if you need to, uh, you click on participants and then there's a, this slide kind of explains how to do that. I won't pretend to be a tech expert. Um, okay. And then in terms of the agenda today, well, we, as I said, we've got a few different speakers and um, we're going to cover something called the Sensitive Choice Program. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Community Asthma Program, which is a really... Uh, like hyperlocal resource, which is great for us to be able to access in the inner west. Uh, and then we're going to talk about asthma action plans for schools and health pathways. So there's some useful resources for promoting high quality asthma care that again are specific for our area. And then we'll wrap up. And then hopefully by the end of this session, what you'll get out of it is a better understanding of um, best practice management for uh, children with asthma and being available of the being aware of the resources available to you and and how we can interact as a community to improve asthma outcomes from children in our area. So at this stage, if people can introduce themselves in the chat just by writing their name, uh, their organisation and their role, that would be really great. Oh, sorry, I only just saw the chat. Can people, oh no, maybe people can't hear me. I think everyone can hear you, Shiv. It's just oh, there's a couple of issues. If anybody's having an issue hearing us, look at the chat box, which isn't helpful because you can't hear us. Um, but try logging out and we'll let you back in again. Um, and there's just been a request that we slow our speaking down, which I'm very guilty for. So the translator can have a bit of time to, um, uh, to translate. Um, and just another translation question that I'll just address while I'm chatting is um, our translator tonight asked um, to put on mute. If you translate through the phone for SOA, if that's OK, um, because if you're off mute, um, we'll hear your translation. We won't be able to hear our speakers tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, so if everyone could, in I can see many people have Oh, sorry, I should slow down. I can see that people have introduced themselves in the chat. If people could keep doing that whilst I move forward. So just by way of facilitators, my name's Shiv. I'm a paediatric respiratory specialist who works at the Children's Hospital. And I think you, everyone would know Kirsty, who's a general practitioner who works in the Inner West. And we're going to get to our first speaker. So we're very lucky that Adele is joining us today. Uh, and Adele is going to talk about something that is called the Sensitive Choice Program. Her background is outlined on this slide, but I think the relevant things that I took out of it was that Adele is a, a real expert in this area, having been a global leader since at least 2017, but longer. 
and also combining that kind of professional experience with the lived experience of someone who's affected by atopic diseases, as well as someone who is a family member and carer for people with asthma, uh, with atopic diseases. So I think that combination is very powerful. And over the next kind of 40 minutes or so, she's going to talk to us about something called the Sensitive Choice Program. So without further ado, I will hand over to Adele. Thanks, Shiv. Let me just get my presentation up and running. Okay, thank you for taking the time uh, to allow me to have a little bit of a chat with you all and introduce the Sensitive Choice Program. Um, if you have any questions, as they have said, just pop it into the chat and I'll try and answer them at the end. Um, so I'm here today to basically introduce Sensitive Choice um, to you all. Now, Sensitive Choice is a cause-related marketing program that was created by the National Asthma Council of Australia back in 2006. What we found is we had a lot of consumers coming to us asking for um, advice on products or services that they can use if they've got the, whether they have asthma themselves or they've got a family member with asthma. And then we also had a number of manufacturers come to us and say, hey, we've got this product that we think could be really useful for someone with asthma. What should we do? And that's how Sensitive Choice was born. Since 2006, we've grown and grown and grown, and we're currently trademarked in over 80 countries around the world. We have 70 partner organisations from the likes of Panasonic and Samsung and Dyson, right through to small sort of mama and papa businesses that have amazing little products that could be really helpful for someone with asthma or allergies. And there's over a thousand approved products. So just to explain a little bit about what Sensitive Choice is, you'll be able to see this blue butterfly logo here on the right. What we do is we actually place that blue butterfly logo on products to help people identify products or services that are asthma and allergy aware through the blue butterfly symbol. So basically our goals are to educate consumers on asthma and allergy management. So therefore when they go shopping to buy products for in and around their home, they'll see a product that has the blue butterfly on it and they know that they're making a educated, better decision in terms of a product to buy. It helps, obviously, to identify products and services that are asthma and allergy friendly. We encourage manufacturers to develop products that are asthma and allergy friendly as well. Now, an example of this recently is we've had an organisation, a large organisation, come to us and say, hey, we would like to get our um, paints approved. And so we've talked to them about the process of getting approved and what they require to get their approval completed. And I will go through this in a little bit more detail soon. But basically, they've now gone away and redeveloped their entire formulation for their asthma, uh, for their paint, sorry, so that they can come back and present it to us for approval. Um, the other big goal with a sensitive choice as part of the National Asthma Council is to generate funds for the asthma and allergy programs that the National Asthma Council Australia runs, both in Australia and overseas. So the tricky part with Sensitive Choice is how you actually go about getting approved. If you ask any of our partners, they'll tell you that it's quite a rigorous process. And usually during the actual approval process, the, the partners get very frustrated with me because I come back and constantly ask them for more information. We're very proud of the rigour behind what Sensitive Choice and the National Asthma Council do with the program. Um, some products and services have taken over 12 months of backwards and forwards between all of our specialists before we'll agree to approve a product. An interesting stat, in the last 12 months, 70% um, of applications that have been submitted to the Sensitive Choice program have either been rejected or we've requested further information. So only 30% of products have been approved in the first instance. Now, the way that it works is we have what we call a product advisory panel that's made up of all sorts of different experts, including pharmacists, GPs, allergists, lawyers, engineers, industrial chemists. There's quite a variety of different specialists. Now, they all come together once every two months and look at these different products and services to decide whether they should wear our Blue Butterfly logo. Now, each of them bring their own expertise and experience, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the examples of, of their unique mindset and the way that they look at these different products. But what it really does is focuses across every aspect of every product or service that we consider. So by the time that you do get the blue butterfly on a product, you know that we've gone through all of that hard work and you can make an educated and, and safer decision. 
Now, when we consider a product, the company must prove that that product or service does everything that is claimed. So for example, if someone comes up to me with an air purifier and they claim it removes 99.97% of airborne particles, I must see independent laboratory testing showing that information. And if we don't have it from an accredited laboratory or testing facility, then we do not consider that information. The other thing that they must do is show that the product or service provides that potential benefit to someone with asthma and allergies. Now, when we talk about sensitive choice, you'll hear us always talking about a potential benefit. Obviously, we can never guarantee that a product or a service is going to stop someone's asthma or allergies because you can't do that. Uh, but what we do is we say that it will provide a potential benefit to someone with asthma or allergies. Now, on the right here is an infographic that we've created of what the approval process is that will be available afterwards uh, just to help explain the process a little bit more. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is talk through a couple of examples of products that have been approved and the thinking behind the actual process just to help show the rigour involved with what we do. Um, so we have this carpet here that you can see on the screen, which is a breeze. It's an Australian manufactured carpet. Now, we only recommend this one carpet in for the Sensitive Choice Program. There's a couple of reasons behind what we do. It's a solution dyed nylon. So the, what I mean by solution dyed nylon is that the actual carpet is dipped in giant vats of the dye. If you, a lot of carpets have actually got the dye sprayed on. Now, if that happens, then what can happen is all of the little color filaments when they, when you walk on the carpet will break apart and go into the air, which can cause a lot of potential um, triggers uh, and sensitizing problems for people with asthma and allergies. So when you solution dye, you're actually soaking the dye into the carpet. So it's embedding into the carpet and it can't just break off with hard wear and tear. The other thing is that this particular carpet is a nylon. Um, now, we had a lot of experts look at whether wool carpet is going to be potentially okay for someone or whether we prefer nylons. What we've found with wool, unless it's below a certain diameter in size of the actual filament of the carpet itself, it can cause a lot of sensitizing issues. So that's why our scientists and our industrial chemists um, actually turn around and said, I think that nylon should actually be a better product. The other thing that we look at is the pile of the carpet. Obviously, a long pile carpet is going to capture all your dirt and dust, but it's also going to be really difficult to vacuum it out. So we've looked at a short pile carpet, which is a twist, not a loop pile. So basically, it's just a single strand of twisted carpet uh, as opposed to a loop. Again, the reason behind this is because you want to make sure that you can vacuum the carpet and get rid of all of your dust and dust mites and pollen and other bits and pieces that are captured in there which will then reduce uh, the likelihood of an asthma or uh, allergy episode. The other really good thing with this particular carpet is it's antimicrobial treated. And what that basically means is it has a special antimicrobial treatment in there, which has also been independently proved by our product advisory panel. That's going to stop mold and uh, mildew and other things from growing underneath your carpets. And it'll also try and inhibit dust mites from being able to breed in there as well. Um, a lot of people say to me, well, why is an antimicrobial important? So if you ever spill something on your carpet or like me, unfortunately, have a very spewy baby, um, when uh, they can obviously throw up onto the carpet and when you clean it up, you're just cleaning what's on the surface and you don't realise what's actually going on underneath. So having that antimicrobial treatment will help stop any mould or other nasty things from growing underneath the carpet, um, which you can't see, but you will feel the, the effects of. Another thing with carpet is really important to look at what underlay you put with it. And so we also recommend putting an antimicrobial treatment in the underlay that goes under your carpet as well. Another example to talk through is air purifiers. Now, this is probably our most uh, popular category. Um, obviously, air purifiers really do help clean the air and the environment within your home. Now, what I'm going to run through now is a list of things that um, you must have to be considered for sensitive choice approval, but this does not guarantee your approval. Um, so we say to all people that are looking to get a purifier product approved that you have to have a HEPA-13 or equivalent filter or even higher that removes your uh, dust mites, uh, your pollen and any airborne particles down to 0.03 microns. Now, this is a perfect example of we need to see laboratory testing from an independent accredited laboratory showing this testing that it goes down to 0.03 microns or less and at a rate of removal of 99.97%. 
So if someone doesn't have at least that level of HEPA filtration, we simply will not consider the product. The other thing that is mandatory is an activated carbon or charcoal filter. Now, this removes your gases, your VOCs and your other chemicals. So, again, we must see test results to show this. So we look at things like formaldehyde removal, ozone emissions and all of those sort of things. Now, something that we are very proud of at Sensitive Choice is keeping up with the times and looking at new research and new data. And what we've found over the last couple of years is a lot of purifier companies and manufacturers have started adding extra filters in there to try and give a competitive advantage and a unique marketing perspective to push their product that's going to be different to all of the others. And in consultation with the University of Melbourne and a number of other universities, we've come to the realisation that a lot of those new filtrations that these companies are putting in, such as ionisers, actually um, have a negative effect on people with asthma and allergies because a lot of them um, create ozone emissions. So what Sensitive Choice has done now is we've sat down in consultation with University of Melbourne and a few other universities and created our own ozone emission level requirements now, if you look at WHO standards, so international um, standards or the Californian Air Board standards, uh, they're actually 0.05 parts per million ozone um, release for any air treatment product. Uh, we've actually gone 10 times higher than that. So any product that is currently sensitive choice approved must have an ozone emission level below 0 0.005 parts per million. What we are also doing is moving forward any products that are submitted for consideration with sensitive choice will not be considered if they have ionizers in them. And we're creating a grandfathering system where we're actually removing any products over the next five years that currently do have ionizers in them. Because obviously we want to make sure that our reputation is protected and that we're making sure that we're looking after consumers and, and the end users of these products. So we don't want to put anything into their home that might be potentially um, negative towards their health. Something else, just as an FYI with regards to purifiers, if you ever are talking to um, patients or consumers or customers, um, make sure that you talk about the room size that they want to use the device in. So there's no point in buying a small purifier and putting it in a big room. So you need to talk about the size of the room, the capacity of the purifier, and then also its filtration functionality as well. Okay, the last example, and I'll talk through this one quite quickly, um, is the Hartridge vinyl flooring. I'll just This one just basically explains the rigor behind what we actually do. So it took over 12 months to get this product to prove. So there was about seven lots of backwards and forwards between our product advisory panel and the uh, actual manufacturer Dunlop flooring. So this is a six layer product that offers a um, an E0 formaldehyde rating. It has no fire lates, a very low VOC. Now, when the panel looked at this product, they actually pulled the six layers apart and looked at each layer individually down to the glue that was used to push all the layers together and then the gluing system that you actually put on the ground. So before they would say, yes, we're happy to approve this product for sensitive choice, they needed to understand all of those different aspects. So we go down into a lot of detail before we'll say yes to a product. Um, and that's part of why I think sensitive choice has been so successful and been around for so many years. So one of the really fun things that we did uh, and we keep doing new versions of it is our Creating a Healthy Home um, plan. So the Creating a Healthy Home campaign was developed back in 2006 and the idea behind this was to create um, and highlight the different triggers found in different rooms within your home and then to suggest products and services that might help combat those triggers and offer some tips and advice when you're looking at each of these different rooms. Now this came about because it's really difficult to control your outside external environment but you can control what happens in your home from an asthma and allergy perspective so we just tried to make this as easy as we could for people to be able to use so it is on the sensitive choice website you can just click through to creating a healthy home and what you basically do is click through to each of the different rooms and it will come up with um, a special page now each room comes with easy to recognize animations and images so it's really clear what rooms we're talking about it has a cleaning checklist that are different ideas and tips that you can use to try and keep your home healthy for each of the specific rooms and then different products and services that have been sensitive choice approved that you can use to help combat some of the issues within the rooms and then each page each room has its own downloadable fact sheet as well so here you can see is an example of what the fact sheets look like 
Um, now I will send this through as a link so you can see it and have a bit of a look at it. But some of the tips that we try and um, suggest to people, things that sometimes they might seem really obvious, but washing your sheets and your pillowcases weekly in water hotter than 55 degrees. Now, if it's hotter than 55 degrees, it means it's killing any of your bacteria and your dust mites and other nasties that are on your bedding. Um, and then we also say another way you can do it as well is if you do have a um, tumble dryer, just throw them in the tumble dryer for 10 minutes and that will kill off any of those as well. Um, things like leaving your wardrobes ajar so that there is good airflow through them. What we find is that mould loves to grow in the back of wardrobes and walk-in robes. And so having that continuous airflow helps to stop any mould and condensation from building up. And one of the big ones we always get is, oh, I try and clean and dust all the time. So we say to people, you need to make sure your cloth is damp when you clean or it's a microfiber cloth because otherwise all you're doing is wiping down your surface and then sending dust back into your environment, which means that you're going to potentially breathe that in. Um, one other one that's a little bit sneaky sometimes is to clean the refrigerator rubber door um, gaskets and your seals. Um, it's not very commonly known, but uh, mould loves to hide within those seals on your refrigerator. So it's a really good thing to make sure that you're regularly recommending people clean those, uh, particularly if someone has uh, a trigger to uh, mould. Uh, we always suggest, particularly in winter, to be aware of signs of condensation. So the first question I'll ask for someone if they're worried about mould or condensation is, when you wake up in the morning, do you ever see uh, condensation or wet on the inside of your windows? This basically shows the lack of air circulation, and then you need to start looking at ways to get the air circulation back in and removing the moisture from the air. Otherwise, you're potentially going to create a, a, the ideal breeding ground for mould and for dust mites. Uh, one of the big ones, which is very, very important right at the moment, we always say to people, don't go outside on high pollen count days or windy days, particularly after thunderstorms. Um, and also when you're drying your clothes outside, if you do have a trigger of hay fever um, or have a pollen allergy, don't dry your clothes outside on high pollen count days and windy days as well, because all that's going to happen is you're going to bring it all back inside, you're going to put it on and you're going to have a, um, a flare up of your asthma or allergies. Okay, so when you're referring patients to the Sensitive Choice Program, um, so basically our motto is all about living better with asthma and allergies. So we basically have created this program to really help people try and improve their lives and to be able to live with asthma and allergies without it running their life. My little girl's two and a half and um, she has a number of allergies. Uh, she's got viral wheezing, so we haven't been able to diagnose asthma yet, um, but she has, yeah, viral wheezing and also has eczema. So I've had to learn how to adapt and change my life to be able to help her better as well. Um, so since sensitive choice has actually taken on a completely new meaning for me since having her, but um, it is a resource hub. So if you jump onto the sensitive choice website, there's heaps of information in there around what is asthma, what is allergies, again, things like creating a healthy home. There's sections on different resources. So there's all sorts of different fact sheets that you can look at. Uh, we've got a range of how-to videos to use your different medical devices. And of course, we've got the whole section on our products and services to help find particular products and services that may benefit someone with asthma and allergies. And with those products and services, you can also search by trigger. So you can actually jump onto the website and say, hey, my trigger is pollen. And it will then come up with a whole lot of different products and services that might be able to help you with your trigger of pollen. Uh, and most importantly, Sensitive Choice was created by the National Asthma Council. So we've got over 30 years of um, history behind us in what we do, and everything is backed by research and testing and evidence. So how we support our um, consumer audiences, we try and make ourselves really visible to consumers as well as to other health professionals. So we go to a series of trade shows, we run video series, we have social media campaigns, we have a website that we're continuously changing. We attend conferences, we do workplace training, we work very closely with retailers such as Harvey Norman, Mize, DJs, et cetera, that have a variety of sensitive choice approved products. And we also create lots of different marketing collateral that we give to health professionals and then we also give to consumer audiences. So one of our most popular marketing um, collaterals is what you see here on the right. It's the air treatment infographic. So it explains the different types of air treatments available being purifiers, dehumidifiers and humidifiers. And then what are the different triggers that are associated with each of those? One of the most common phone calls that we get in our office is help. I think I need a humidifier for my baby's room. 
Um, and then so we sort of go, okay, let's let's talk a little bit through why you think you need a humidifier. We ask them what their issues and triggers are. And more often than not, we find out actually it's an air purifier that you need. Uh, and a lot of people don't know the difference between the three devices. Um, so very quickly, an air purifier will clean the air. A dehumidifier removes moisture from the air. And a humidif humidifier actually puts moisture in the air. Now, 90% of Australia doesn't need a humidifier. It really is only in those dry outback areas and in certain circumstances when there's potentially young children with breathing issues, but they must consult a GP before we sort of talk about that in any more detail. Okay, so next steps from here, um, I'll be sending out a link to this video, but it's a basically a two minute edu educational video that explains what sensitive choice is. Now it's really great for yourself to understand what it is, but it's also good to pass on to potential patients um, and carers uh, just to help understand what it is and how they can use the sensitive choice program. Feel free to visit the Sensitive Choice website at sensitivechoice.com and then the National Asthma Council website at nationalasthma.org.au. And then you can also follow both organisations on socials as well. So we have Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And here are a couple of those resources that I um, was suggesting. So again, we'll send all of these details out to you afterwards, but we have a whole section on knowing and understanding what your triggers are, what concerns are. Now, a big part of the concerns page is things like weather events and thunderstorm asthma. So we have up-to-date fact sheets on thunderstorm asthma that were created in conjunction with the National Asthma Council and um, the Victorian government, et cetera. So we have amazing resources available for everybody um, if you wanted to have a little bit of a look over. That's everything from me. Um, I think I've gone okay with my time and just yeah. if anyone has any questions. Well, um, thank you very much, Adele. That's That was brilliant and very helpful. And I learned a lot uh, that's going to impact my clinical management. And there are definitely questions because they've been coming through in the chat okay. and we have 15 minutes. So what I might do is tackle the, we might tackle the questions in the chat first. There's quite a few. And then people can just, once we get through those, we people can just come off mute and ask their own questions. But I want to start at the top. So right from the very start, is um, sensitive choice uh, focused on asthma and allergy? What about eczema and hay fever products? Uh, yes. So we definitely do have all of those as well. From a hay fever perspective, we have products like nasal sprays and nasal washes. And then from an eczema perspective, we don't um, have any specific um, over-the-counter treatments or medically medical devices that we approve through Sensitive Choice. So it's more things like looking at body washes and shampoos and conditioners that you can use on your skin that aren't going to cause any reactions. So we don't have anything that's got fragrances in it or any nasty sort of chemicals. Awesome. Thank you. Next question, and I think this was in reference to the carpet product that um, you mentioned, and I think, and it had an antimicrobial treatment. Yes. The question was, how long does the antimicrobial treatment last for? Does it need to be, does that treatment need to be done, you know, routinely? No, it doesn't. So that's a fantastic question. And that's actually one of the things that our panel look at when they're approving a product with an antimicrobial in it. So it, it works in a similar way to the solution dyed um, process. So it's actually drenched inside the product and then it's dried. So it's embedded within the product and it will last the lifetime of your carpet. Cool. Okay. Uh, the next question was, I think this was maybe around, came through around the time you were talking about um, uh, air purifiers and, and the issues with particle size and things. Does that have any relevance to air conditioners? And are there any air conditioners that are part of the Sensitive Choice program? Yes and yes. So uh, we do actually exclusively work with um, Dakin for their um, split system air conditioners, uh, but we also do work with a couple of other air conditioning companies for your um, ducted systems. But basically air conditioners work a little bit differently because you're trying to push air through such a large environment within your home in a, in a whole room and a whole house scenario. So the filtration requirements for air conditioners is slightly different to how it works for a purifier that sits somewhere around the 90% mark rather than your 99.97%. Great. Thank you. We're about to get split systems installed. So now I'm frantically trying to check what we're getting installed and if it's taken. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, next question. Um, when a product is approved by sensitive choice, how long does that approval last? 
Um, so we run on three year cycles. So basically once a product is approved, we'll have it approved for three years. And at the end of that three years, assuming there's been no significant changes um, with the research or what's happening within that particular area, um, or they haven't changed the products altogether, we would uh, renew them for a further three years. And if we do happen to get to a six year cycle where the product hasn't um, changed, we would re-review that product again and we would go through the entire process again. Cool. Okay. And then uh, I think the, this is the last question in the chat. So maybe people in the audience could um, start thinking about ones they want, might want to ask um, is there was an argument for how hot water in the bathroom bathroom should be due to the risk of burns for kids. Mm -hmm. And there was a suggestion that the thermostat of hot water should be no more than 45 to 50 degrees. But how do we balance this with uh, washing linen clothing over 55 degrees? So in the circumstances where you can't wash your clothing over 55 degrees, that's when we would recommend if you have the tumble dryer to pop it in the tumble dryer for 10 minutes and that will kill off the dust mites, et cetera, as well. Um, but often what we found is that the actual washing machines are able to um, heat the water up hotter than what comes out of your tap. So it still is able to achieve um, the results. We actually do have a sensitive choice approved washing machine by ASCO that has a specific um, allergy setting that will heat to 60 degrees. Amazing. Okay. And so with so that's all the questions in the chat. So now um, from the audience, maybe if you have a question, if you could pop your hand up or just write it in the chat, that would be great. And then we still have another 10 minutes for questions. So uh, Kirsty. Always got questions. Always got questions. <laughs> Adele, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, first is building products. Are there any building products approved by Sensitive Choice? Because Absolutely. I'm quite interested in that, especially as I work in Truganina, which was a bunch of fields and didn't exist uh, seven years ago in the western suburbs. Yeah. And um, the asthma and allergies are wild and definitely there's environmental and pollen and pollution factors, but I wonder how much it is um, building materials that have uh, been included in all the new built houses. Yes, so building uh, materials is actually a passion area of mine. In my spare time, I'm crazy enough to be one of those people that love building and renovating houses. Um, every time I do it, I say I'm never going to do it again, and then I will do it again. Um, but what we like to say is that we can build a house from the inside out with sensitive choice. So we have obviously carpets and underlays and flooring. There's paint for your walls. There's insulation. Um, over in New Zealand, we, we work with New Zealand Steel on the frames for your houses. There's different roofing options. Options. There's whole home ventilation systems um, and purification systems. So, yes, we have a range of building products that are sensitive choice approved, which we can use um, in our homes. We are also uh, talking to a number of uh, big builders about actually building sensitive choice approved homes as well. Now, obviously, that's a very complex and long process, uh, and we're about three years in with one particular builder, but we're hoping the end outcome will be able to be a sensitive choice approved approved home. Um, we do know that there are a lot of organisations that are moving out into the sort of the western suburbs with their manufacturing plants and we're very proud to work with some of them such as Dunlop Floorings which is in Truganina and their whole warehouse and plant is being designed to be asthma and allergy friendly um, in terms of the way that they do their recycling and the way that they store all of their products so that they don't let anything out into the environment so all of those things um, uh, play a part in our, in our partnerships with our uh, manufacturers as well. Fascinating. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, uh, the second thing was just a couple of things you mentioned. So you talked about humidifiers. Yes. Um, we have been doing the community of practice for about 18 months now, and we talked about humidifiers a while ago and actually how popular they are within um, the community, yes. but how actually they could explode your house dust mite population. Yes. So where's the trade-off there? You, you specifically said only in really dry conditions, but... Um, is anybody clinically or Adele, are you seeing that they are actually of benefit for asthmatics in those conditions versus making They can be, but I'm going to flag at this point in time, I personally am not a medical professional, um, so I don't want to say anything that's going to be considered to be medical advice. So there are definitely circumstances where a humidifier is required um, for 
to cover and assist with certain medical conditions. Um, but generally speaking, people have got a false understanding that humidifiers and making the air wetter is going to help their children be able to breathe better. But all it does is create that breeding, breeding ground for dust mites and just the idea of mould growing, it's, it's crazy. So we always try and push everyone back to looking at a purifier because most of the time that's actually what they need. Can I ask somebody who does know when we should be using humidifiers? Shiv, Catherine, any of the asthma yeah, nurses, yeah. when would you recommend a humidifier? Uh, I mean, my my opinion on it, which I must admit, it's not like I've done a recent literature review or anything, but uh, I'd say never in our location. So, so you know, we, you know, maybe if you ask me in Alice Springs or somewhere, it might be a slightly different answer, but I still think... The only time I can think of where a humidification is important is for patients who are on like home oxygen or something like that, where we want to humidify the circuit to prevent there from drying out. But really, that's the only time we ever use humidifiers is in that very niche specialized situation. And I, I think I wouldn't ever recommend them for children in the inner west of Melbourne or in, anywhere in Victoria, actually. And something I would just uh, bring up, um, and it's absolutely not to pass comment on uh, your daughter's medical condition in any way, Adele, it's just for our general education, because we've been sort of talking for about a year now on how we describe preschool asthma. Mm -hmm. And very much so, um, most of us were saying viral wheeze. So um, I'm not needing medical information. I don't want to comment on it. Just for everybody here um, from our point of view and when we refer to asthma in the preschoolers, we will still be calling it preschool asthma. Um, just if that caused any confusion with people, um, as far as I'm aware, Shiv uh, hasn't changed his guidelines. It's still preschool <laughs> asthma, just for communication purposes. Yeah, I, that, that it was interesting just to hear you say that, Adele, because I, I think it just speaks to the amount of confusion that's out there in the community and why it's really important that things like this happen where we we um have a harmonized approach in 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 what we do. And if if we all call it one thing, I think it makes people's lives, families' lives a lot easier. So yeah, well, there's definitely a lot of confusion. We've had, um, I think, about 10 hospitalizations with it since the start of the year. And pretty much every time we come out, we say it slightly differently. But I thought viral we wheezing was a nice, easy one. But I'll, I'll remember to call it preschool asthma moving forward. <laughs> oh, no, I, I think yeah, I think you should do. No, anyway, I, I think it just yeah. Yeah, you should do whatever you you and your, your daughter's team think is the appropriate thing to call it. But I, I think, yeah, fast. If, if you happen to live in the inner west of Melbourne or see one of us, hopefully we would just use the term preschool asthma. Um, I might ask a question, or but unless someone else uh, wants to. I guess that one of the questions for me is, um, well, you know, we see families from a whole range of different socioeconomic backgrounds and the, the, with this, with a number of the things you've described, like the there is a financial implication and it's not like we can write a script for a home renovation or, or you know, PBS is going to cover it. So I always do get a little bit um, anxious about that tension, about um, yep. uh, that. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that. And then the second thing is just the idea of the potential benefit aspect of it. So, so like how much do... I, I'm guessing there isn't like a randomized control trial where asthmatic patients are, are like randomized to each sensitive choice project uh, product or placebo uh, to work out if it improves asthma outcomes. So just, yeah, I, I guess those two things, because they're a little bit interrelated. Yeah, definitely. So with the financial side of things first, we completely understand that not everyone's going to be able to go out and buy a, you know, $2,000 vacuum cleaner and things like that. So we always try and make sure when we're looking at products that we're looking at products on all ends of the spectrum from a financial perspective. Um, so we, we do consider those things, but we also provide a lot of advice for things that you can do that don't actually cost anything. So looking at, say, um, if you feel like you have uh, a mould issue or condensation issue within your home, we talk about ventilating and using your exhaust fans in your bathrooms and your kitchens and, and you know, opening a window when it's appropriate and how you can clean, you know, mould with home um ingredients rather than going out and buying expensive mold cleaners and things like that so we we do offer advice and guidance 
guidance uh, on things that you can do in and around the home that don't actually require you to go out and buy a product. But when we do look at products, we try and make sure that we have products that suit all um, budgets and, and financial situations. And then with the second part of it, so I, I probably should have really made it clear at the very start, everything that's sensitive choice approved is not a medical device in, in any way. Um, so we only consider your normal household products. So when we look at um, potential benefits, it's um, we some in some cases we do do um, sort of trials and tests with a lot of the products that we look at from an eczema perspective. We make sure that they have uh, skin patch testing, as an example, done with people with sensitivities so that we can see, hey, is there a reaction or not? Um, and what we have is a very strict panel of experts that say if there's been even one reaction out of a skin patch testing, then we will not consider the product um, at all. So there is a lot of um, strict criteria that way. We also look at the chemicals in products. And we have an industrial chemist whose passion is air, um, and she will break things down into the tiniest of microbes and say, you know, this particular ingredient, which is 0.01% concentrate, you know, could cause an asthma reaction. So bang, that's it, that product's not approved. So it's very strict in how we go about doing it. And we do require all of that testing in there to make sure that we're doing it right. Thank you. Um, I was I, I was listening to someone talking about um, uh, just like how we can be more green, like as in, you know, with, with climate change and things. And one of the points they raised is like, you don't need to... Um, there are like all these appliances in your house and like your car where if you went to an electric version, that would be great. But if you did that, most people would go bankrupt if you did in one go. So the way to maybe think about it is that just the next time you're going to change it, which might be in 10 years time or it might be next year, if at that point you can swap to a, a more environmentally friendly choice, that's a good thing to do. So maybe that's a way we can, I might think about pitching this to my families is go to the sense of choice website. There's a whole lot of stuff you can do for no cost. That'll be helpful. And then if you are going to change something like your vacuum cleaner or your washing machine um, and you're wanting some guidance, you know, next time you do that, whenever that is, that might be a useful resource that you can look at to help you with that decision. Absolutely. So what we often say when we're talking to health professionals is just tell your patients to look for the blue butterfly when they're making a purchasing decision. Um, now that you've all seen it today, you're going to see blue butterflies everywhere for the next couple of weeks because it's in the mind. But there should be a blue butterfly attached to most products in and around the home. So yes, exactly. When you are going shopping, next time you're making one of those purchases, look for the blue butterfly on the products. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, we're right on 7.15. Um, thank you very much, Adele, and thank you for sharing those resources and things. Um, I think I think that it's going to be really helpful because it's a commonly asked question and my answer's always been a bit unsatisfactory thus far. So, um, yeah, that's really great. Uh, what we might do now is swap to Hannah. Um, thank so you so much for having me. And hopefully you can sleep tonight with the... Um, pub or I guess go and get a drink. Um, <laughs> uh, so we're very lucky to have Hannah joining us from um, CoHealth. So I'm, I think that CoHealth probably needs no introduction. They have a really great uh, community asthma program that operates in the inner west, which uh, Hannah's going to talk, tell us about. Um, and then more specifically in terms of Hannah's background, uh, Hannah's a health promotion officer who works at um, CoHealth and supports the uh, community asthma program and the evaluation of that that we're doing over the next uh, next year or so. So with that, do you want to take over, Hannah? Yes, absolutely. Can you see my slides okay? Oh, I can't, but that might just be me. Can anyone see Hannah? Yeah, I can see, see Hannah's slides. Uh, well, no Probably problems. just something yeah, with wonderful. Computer. Great. Perfect. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Shiv. My name is Hannah. I'm a health promotion officer with CoHealth, and I've got some time this evening to tell you a little bit about the Community Asthma Program. I'm sure many of you are aware of the Community Asthma Program, um, but it is a free service that is run by CoHealth and also DPV Health. Just see my typo there. Isn't it wonderful when you see the typos when you're talking through slides? Uh, so we have a team of asthma educators who offer asthma education and support for um, children up to the age of 17. 
and who have asthma or preschool asthma have updated to have the correct terminology. I hope that is appreciated. Um, so our team of asthma educators work one-on-one -on -one with children and their families and conduct home visits, telehealth, or um, families can come in to the clinic. We also have obviously interpreters available. And the wonderful thing about our CAP service is that we will liaise with um, education settings, childcare, kinder schools, as well as GPs, specialists, um, hospitals and the like. I guess as our topic this evening is around household triggers, CAP um, really works in well with this in that they can offer home visits. So our educators can go to family home and make recommendations and sort of assess the home environment to identify potential triggers in the home. So all those things that um, were just discussed, like dust, um, heating, um, assessing piles of soft toys and if they are triggers, um, of course, smoking animals, um, looking at clutter, the team can also, in some cases, if required, I guess, advocate to sort of housing department or landlords if, if necessary in those situations. So I shall quickly run through the um, process of a family going through the CAP service, so receiving a referral, our referrals are received and allocated quite quickly and initial phone contact with a family can happen um, within a week. Um, from the bottom of the screen, initial assessment and education can happen, as I mentioned, in the home, in the clinic or via telehealth. Um, and that's where some between that, that liaison, liaison with um, GPs or other health professionals can occur. Um, I guess the length of time uh, a client or in family will stay on the service can vary and that's really dependent on if say the family is um, got a long-standing diagnosis and just needs um, some support with a couple of things or if they're more complex and needing some more support um, there can be a sort of ongoing appointments um, phone reviews or reviews. I think it's just really beneficial to remember that um, this is really individualized care um, and of course uh, families are um charged but can come back onto the service at any time if other issues crop up. Um, so for co-health we are primarily in the west and in a north DPV health also um, is on the screen there. Well these slides will be shared by email after session in the coming days. Um, as for referrals, we receive referrals from anywhere, so GPs, uh, pharmacists, nurses, MCH, school nurses. We also accept referrals from families. If we look back um, from the period of July 2022 to 2023, we're actually getting the most of our referrals from hospitals, which is amazing. We love to see that, but we would love to see more referrals from GPs. You can see that we're getting quite a small number from GPs at the moment. Um, if you're interested in um, hearing more about the CAP service and potentially having me come along to your service and present this information, this is what the register to find out more QR code is about. I will also share in the chat in a moment our referral form. Very excitingly, uh, CoHealth has a nurse practitioner clinic um, debt, which will be starting in the coming weeks, I understand. And this is a nurse practitioner will, which will sit inside the Community Asthma Pro Program. Um, the service will be offered two days and we're just really um, offering that higher level support to families um, really acting on timely review after discharge from hospital um, improving utilisation of written asthma action plans and optimising asthma management and that high level coordination with other specialist services and GPs through collaborative practice. As for how to, I guess, get your families in, well, um, clients into this service, um, there will just be referrals made in the, in the same way as normal and the CAP team will triage and refer to the nurse practitioner as required. That's really it from me. I've just 
popped on our contact details and as I said, I'll share some um, links in the slides. If you're um, using best practice software, we will have our referral form, which will have the details for CoHealth and DPV Health uh, uploaded. So it should make that process of referring to CoHealth and DPV community ASTRA programs easier. Um, that's it for me. I think there may be some questions, but um, yeah, I will stop sharing and yeah, ask away. Thanks so much, Hannah. That's uh, really helpful. I think there was a question in the chat that uh, about spirometry, but um, Joanne's already answered that. And then Joanne said, I think that the nurse practitioner clinic is starting next week. And I, I reckon that's super exciting and really great. Uh, we have seven minutes for questions and so I might kick us off before and then people could maybe either put their questions in the chat or raise their hand. Uh, firstly, I'd say the say CAP is a great program and 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 co-health is phenomenal and I love it when they're engaged with patients I'm involved with. Uh, the, I guess it's mainly a question for the group. It kind of surprises me to see that the majority of referrals come from hospitals and so um, because I know that GPs do the bulk of the work in terms of seeing children with asthma. And um, so I'm just wondering if anyone, if that's surprising to other people and if they can think about whether they think it should be used more and any barriers to using it. Um, so yeah, a question for the group. I'll jump in there, Shiv. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, although it saddens me, because I feel like I might make up that entire section of that pie chart from GP referrals, because <laughs> Hannah's laughing. I refer about a patient a day. Um, I I didn't see any GPs join today. Maybe um, they didn't pop their uh, name in the chat box, but if there are GPs um, here that are in the area, the service is incredible. It is my favorite service. The communication is brilliant. And I know when um, my patients engage with the CAP team, I just don't need to worry. I don't need to worry about them coming back. I don't need to worry about education. I don't need to worry about miscommunication on my part, on their part, on anybody else's part. Um, it all just gets sorted out and they engage and they come back and their asthma is controlled. I haven't sent one kid there who doesn't now have well-controlled asthma. Um, so it's a fantastic service. I would say the barrier is just lack of... Um, knowledge about the service my main thing for moving from secondary care to primary care is how you get information when a hospital most services are on site and any specific services are directed to your speciality when you're working across anything that walks through the door you are flooded with information every day you come into your pigeon box full I get about 30 emails from various agencies every day advertising services um, you get the private sector advertising services to you, you get reps and it's constant um, and it's really hard to process all of it. And you tend to fall into a pattern of using the services that you come across because you went to a conference or that colleague recommends, quite honestly, because there is no one cohesive service. And on that, I was wondering if the CAP, I didn't realise you could self-refer to CAP. Is it on health pathways, do you know, Hannah, or in the RCH asthma link? Because if that was there, and because that's maybe we could something we could action with a working group and people, because I always refer to the RCH guidelines, um, obviously patients can't access health pathways, but if GPs were on there looking for extra support and could see the link, um, maybe some of our consumers could comment on if they saw that sort of link, would they be inclined to self-refer to that sort of service? I believe it is on Health Pathways. I could be wrong. I mean, the... I'm, I'm about to look up Health Pathways and show you all, so let's look. <laughs> well, I think and, we should... Oh, I was just going to say, CAP team are very... We're very flexible. We can, From a self-referral -refer perspective, a phone call is enough to process from, from a family. Obviously, we're wanting a bit more from a GP or health professional referring. Um, yeah, sorry, Chip. Uh, I was just going to say, so from a hospital point of view, we built it into a electronic medical record so if there is if a certain postcode comes up in asthma then there's like a prompt that they can be referred we might struggle to get under the clinical practice guidelines because even though the house by rch they're now endorsed across like four states so it's a reduced our ability to put anything super local on there which is a bit disappointing you know is a downside but I, I think it would be good to get into the 
the health pathway. So maybe we let's take that away and work on that. Wait, a question. Uh, I'll jump in. Sorry, yeah. from the PHN. Yes, it is included on the health pathway. Oh, perfect. There we go. Great. And do you know, how long does it take you to complete a referral? Because I know you're, you know, like you know, it's not like you have. Is it a quick process for you? Yes. Can you, can you oh, do sorry. It? Like within, is that for me? Yeah, within a busy yes. GP clinic, is it? Yes, feasible yes, yes. To, Well, yeah. I believe um, from some feedback, the news, the new referral is going to be slightly different, and it's even more intuitive. It will kind of have almost tick boxes or a guidance of what information. Previously, it was literally just the information of the child and not much clinical details at all because the asthma educators are well able to get through it. But obviously, it's helpful to have. Um, but I believe I was speaking to Hannah about some changes to the referral pathway. But yeah, it's quick. It's easy. It's a, it's a very quick form. Yes. Yeah, we are, come December, we will be, our referral form will be built into best practice software. I know that some clinics use other software, so working on that as well. But yeah, um, any feedback is very welcome. Okay, so it's quick to refer, and then I think in, in the chat it was raised that once a referral's gone in, um, usually they're processed within a few days to a week, so that's always good to know that it's going to be, the families will get a timely response. Um, I think, uh, Joanne, you had your hand up. Did you want to make a comment? Yeah, just a couple of quick things. Um, in terms of the nurse practitioner referral, um, we'll also be aiming if kids have been in hospital and they can't get in to see their GP um, for that sort of 72 up to a week um, review after being in hospital, we'll be trying to slot that into the NP clinic until we can get them back in with their GP, um, just so that you know that that will be sort of in our minds when the referrals come through as well. We'll be looking at timelines. Um, and... I would love if there was more GPs on tonight because I'm really looking to recruit them so that um, a lot of our families come through, they don't have a regular GP, which is why they'll end up with the NP service while we try to find them a GP to go on with um, because the CAP NP service is obviously a transient service. Um, we want them to then to build, rebuild their relationship with general practice. So I'm hoping to recruit as many GPs who are keen to take on paediatric asthma patients um, that we can sort of build relationships with so that they can refer to CAP, but also we can refer back to them um, patients that don't have a GP currently. Great. Bit of business, but John, we meant to get back to you. We'll, we'll take them. We'll, we'll, we're happy to take those. I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm really we, the big gaps are kind of Werribee Hoppers way. I don't have anyone out there. I'm, I'll send them all to you, Kirsty. <laughs> and I've got one in other areas, but it's like, yeah, really way out west. I need a few more uh friends. Well, it looks like Eleanor Clinic's happy to have referrals and they have a pediatric respiratory physician. Interesting. Uh that's well, you'll have the Rolls Royce service there. Uh Catherine, you've got your hand up and then we might uh, have to move on to the rest of the session. Thanks, Shiv. Just really um, briefly, um, Hannah recently shared with me some of the data and um, was putting together a grant. Um, and since the start of ICAMP, there actually have been a few self-referral and that's a new thing um, since the start of ICAMP. So I think that's a really great thing. If we're thinking about how we increase self-referrals, I think it's great to include in medical guidelines, but then you already have a doctor who could put the referral in. Perhaps we can look at other um, avenues, like for example, schools or pharmacies and having that information around there that families can access to or teachers, for example, often notice that children have asthma and they're not accessing services. That is another pathway that families could self-refer um, from schools bringing it up. That's a good idea, Catherine, that we should try to think about how we engage them. Uh, that would be, Adele's just mentioned promoting CAP through sensitive choice. I think that would be good. The only thing is it's a relatively local service and you have a, ver a very big footprint, but if there's a way you can um, promote it for the local area, that would be beautiful. 
Yeah, we absolutely can do that. So maybe I'll um, chat with Hannah. And I personally have experienced CAP with my little one. Um, and I think the lovely Emma is actually online today, who is our um, our nurse. So she's done an amazing job with us. And even though I work for the National Asthma Council, was able to provide me with so much more information that I didn't know. And just that help and support with my daughter's childcare and with the grandparents and everything else, it's, it's an amazing service. Lots of good testimonials. That's great. And um, I think, uh, Joanne, your call for re you've rec successfully recruited a few GPs because there was the Eleanor Clinic one and then Anari from the Alfred Road Medical Centre in Werribee is also, um, has also put their hand up. So, uh, okay. I'm that's noting been... them down. Excellent. Well, okay, that's been uh, really great. So I think we've got just under half an hour to go and um, Kirsty's going to take over and... Um, just cover a few few points, um, which I think are mainly, hopefully, will be a discussion amongst us. Um, yeah, and then to close out the evening. Hi, everybody. Just uh, my usual issues trying to share tech. So let me know if you can see my screen. We can see your screen. Does it have slides on it? <laughs> it's got slides, but not in like a now. Yep, yeah, now it's perfect. Fabby. Great. Okay, I'm gonna have to uh, just clip through this a little bit. So we just um, wanted to move on while I'm getting to the right um, slide. A question for Adele. Kevin from Asthma Australia had asked if you know of any incentives to use sensitive choice. Um, are there any financial aids? Uh, any the asthma nurses know that? Is there any buy one get one free offers? I presume that's what um, Kevin met. If it's not, um, correct me, Kevin. Um, from my perspective, uh, we definitely do work with a number of the different manufacturers to try and create, um, you know, op uh, opportunity. So at the moment, there's actually starting this afternoon, uh, a Black Friday special uh, EDM has gone out and there's probably about 15 different sort of discounts and special offers for different products that are sensitive choice approved. Um, if that's what you were uh, meaning, but we do regularly work with par uh, partners that will give discounts for people that are after sensitive choice approved products. Great. Thanks very much. No and uh, we're just going to move, I hope that answers the question. If not, just pop up into the chat if there's any further points you want clarified. We're just going to move on to a poll question about who is referring to a community asthma program. We're going to have this as a recurring poll just to see if it's increasing over the next um, sort of six to eight months. So I'll let Shiv uh, pop that up for everybody because I believe he knows how to do it. Hopefully it should have appeared for everyone. Can everybody see that? So it should say um, community asthma program question. Are you referring patients to the community asthma program? Yes, no and no, but I might in the future. Um, okay. <laughs> we'll just let it run for another 15 seconds or so, and then I can end the poll. Yeah, I think there's 30 of, odd of us here, so. Can everyone see the responses coming through in real time or is it that just me? I can, but it might just be us. Right. Okay, cool. Woo! I think what I'll do now is I'll maybe, okay. You can tell that I've never done this before and I don't know what's going to happen when I push end the poll. So I'm going to take a picture in the poll, share results. Can everyone now see the results? Did that work? So yeah, it did. Excellent. Beautiful. Well, that's good. So about half of people had uh, made referrals, but the other half said likely to make referrals in the future. So that's, uh, I think, a really good uh, outcome. And hopefully CAP will have a flurry, but not be overly inundated. And I'll Brand. stop sharing that. Okay. Um, I can't I think I need to cancel it as well. Oh. 
Okay, so um, just in the final few minutes, we were going to talk briefly um, uh, and elaborate on a conversation we were having within the working group and um, asthma action plans. Some of you may know that the next topic in January is back to school. Now that's going to include talk about asthma action plans and um, troubleshooting issues that we have filling them in schools may be having hopefully we will have a representative from the education sector at it um and we will also be talking about common things that we find when kids go back to school such as recurrent um increase in infections exercise induced asthma um is it fitness or is it wheeze um, so we're going through all of it um, and we had quite a lively discussion about asthma action plans last time. We thought we would try and clarify some issues or some points that you would want us to go away as a working group and try and bring back answers for in January. So the question to everybody in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself is um, what issues are you having with that asthma um, action plans? What ones are you using? Um, and that can be practical and um, people aren't bringing them in. They're only bringing them last minute. They're not bringing their children in. Um, they find them clunky or hard to use. Uh, there's no engagement between the medical sector and the education sector. These are all just things that have come up and, and things we'll be looking at. But this is just a brief forum to allow people to bring up any other issues. And um, consumers, please tell us uh, the problems you have with it so we can jot them down and try and address them at our working group next week and try and bring you answers at the end of January um, so that we can be prepared for the start of the school year and the influx of asthma plans that we will all be getting in primary care. Anybody? It's important to note that the uh, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare just put out their report on asthma and it said that a third of children don't have an asthma action plan. So whatever we can do amongst ourselves to make it as easy as possible will be really good. Um, but thank you, Amy. So asthma action plan working well since the change in best practice using it daily. Okay, well, that sounds good. So some of the issues that we brought up last time was um, people bringing in uh, asthma plans in January um, without kids for an asthma review because the dates had said date for review. Um, it's usually the end of January because that's when we tend to do them all. Um, but being told by schools that they can't go back to school unless they have one that's in date. And it's really important to note for anybody new um, today you'll have heard us talk about this a lot if you're not new, that the asthma plans do not expire. It's like a highlighter saying, my kid has asthma, but a review date means a clinical review date. They're for the child and their inhaler and their spacer needs to be there. So when we're doing the asthma reviews in January, it's perfectly acceptable to say, you have that plan, it's still valid for your school next year, as per the Department of Health, um, an education website, they can look it up, but I'm not going to do an asthma review until you bring your kid in so we can actually review their asthma. Um, we found that a lot of the care is being devolved to school and parents because they felt they had this plan and then they were a bit abandoned. Um, and we've had some of our consumers feedback that it feels like that too. So it's really important that when we're doing our asthma plans, that we are actually using it to review children's care and then setting the follow up, making the referrals to the community asthma program. One of the amazing services that they can do is actually do in reach into schools and daycares that are struggling to manage asthma. Um, so there are sort of things we're going to be looking at and hopefully in January, as I say, we'll have a, a member of Department of Education and perhaps a school nurse. If anybody knows anybody who'd be willing to speak, we would love to hear from them and um, to tell us their point of view, how we can link up better care between uh, the education sector and the healthcare sector. Anna-Marie said, which asthma plan should we take to the GP to complete? So Anna-Marie, they can, the GP can use any asthma plan. You don't need to take one to the GP. Um, they should have it embedded in their software. Um, 
really it's the one that you find most intuitive to use that's the way I use it so we tend to use the Asthma Australia one because it's one I'm familiar with and the National Asthma Council um, is really clear really easy to read um, and they both have translated options as well um, so if you're a patient it's something you troubleshoot um, as a client or as a healthcare provider if you're um, having trouble managing it the school is maybe using a different plan to see if it's more clear for them I hope that answers that um, I'm not a clinician but the challenge remains in shifting the understand from that and the asthma action plan as an action something that is done rather than just a piece of paper Jason, by that, do you mean for um, for people who are caring for people with asthma, such as parents and caregivers, or for schools? Do you, wanna, if you yeah, want to? Yeah. Um, thanks. Like, thanks, Kirsty. Uh, yeah, I I I think that a lot of people see the asthma action plan as just a, something that has to get done, as he said, on a twelve month basis, rather than an actual plan or an action. And I, and I do wonder what the actual adherence rates of asthma action plans are when children have their asthma exacerbation and whether there needs to be that more emphasis on I'm not just giving you a piece of paper but we're actually going to practice the technique together and more of that emphasis on actually upskilling the individual and actually completing it rather than just filling out the form with them and if you had any thoughts on that Kirsty. Um, I completely agree. Um, I'm definitely much more thorough with the change in the asthma action plans last year. I agree with Amy. Um, and having it integrated. And I really, really, really hammer home to patients. This is your asthma action review. It comes with a plan and you give that plan to school so they know your kid's asthmatic. But all we expect from school is to do emergency asthma care, really. We don't expect them to be telling you you need to increase or decrease your flixotide dose so they need to go on oral steroids. We expect emergency asthma care. The plan is for you to be able to manage asthma at home appropriately until you can seek medical help and a lot of the preschool wheezers who are viral triggered or seasonal triggered which we're still getting a lot of I'm saying so next time it happens and you're looking at this plan don't think oh god I've got the plan now I can't come back I'm fully expecting you to be back in two weeks time the next high pollen day and us to see each other loads over the next few weeks for you to clarify and with the community asthma plan backing that up, that's what I've been finding. I'm seeing these patients so much more in the first two months. And then by that time, usually they're all on flixitide and, and it's kicked in and we don't see them and they're well managed. And just putting in that extra bit of communication that for the next two months, you're going to be seeing a lot of me as your kid gets coughs and colds and high pollen days. Um, or is playing sports um, and after that I'll be comfortable with diagnosis and your ability to management you'll be more comfortable with assessment you'll have seen the community asthma plan uh, uh, program they'll be uh, having input hopefully they've educated the school if we're having some issues there as well um, but I completely agree it's more than saying this is just a bit of paper you need for school uh, um, I would say Jason I would 100% agree with that and I think what you're kind of getting at, and I think what Kirsty has nicely articulated is that, and I think there's actually a lot of data to support this, that currently asthma is, and most of our interactions with people around asthma is management of acute episode, and we just lurch, lurch from acute episode to acute episode, where and we don't do the things we know will help us prevent those episodes and manage provide optimal asthma control and manage it as a chronic disease. And a chronic disease is something that might sound scary, but often isn't if you do the simple things like educate a family, get a basic management plan in, part of that supporting it with some written information, which is the asthma action plan. But a lot of it is the education of the family. So I think um, you're 100% right. And I think Kirsty's kind of nicely articulated what that looks like in actual clinical practice i'll just address a question here in the chat um from we cheng so we cheng you're right it did disappear um and i've been part of this group for 18 months and it disappeared on me one day and i didn't know what had happened so there was a decision made um we Chen has said uh, the education specific asthma plan again i'll just briefly cover in victoria there used to be an education specific asthma plan national asthma council asthma australia Lots of services had them. 
what happened was this was making it confusing and time consuming because doctors were doing a asthma plan for clinical management at home, how to escalate and de-escalate. Then they were doing an emergency treatment plan, essentially, for education. It's time consuming. It's confusing for parents. It's an extra bit of paper. And Victoria was the only state that had an education specific plan. So the decision was made to remove it and schools now have to accept any plan to streamline the process and make sure that we're focusing on asthma and not the plan and the bit of paper. Um, we just use the asthma care plan for home. We don't expect schools, as I said before, to escalate and de-escalate treatment. We just expect them to use asthma first aid. And that is causing a lot of confusion, which is why we're talking about it in more detail next time. Um, and we said, I do find that we still have schools rejecting the non-Victorian schools one. Um, yes, yes, that happens. I often write letters saying you don't need to have the non-Victorian schools one. And that's why we want to involve the Department of Education next time to get more communication around the beginning of school to really get that out there. Um, to say it, it doesn't matter and and from a, a school nurse's point of view um i've got a, a a case history which i probably don't have time to share but i'll i'll bring it up next time about confusion between um a very experienced school nurse um treating asthma very well um because they had the experience but probably doing much more than i would ever expect someone to do in the school setting um, and probably much better that we standardise what we expect from cares, uh, schools to either calling a parent or calling an ambulance and giving emergency treatment. Um, Kevin's just mentioning all the Victorian based education plans have been removed for that reason, so they can't get access to them. Um, and we tend saying the ASCIA one is also good. OK, feel free if anybody wants to email us or contact us with any issues they're having with the asthma plans, please bring them up and we will troubleshoot them in January. But that is the plan for January to have the Department of Health, hopefully a school nurse and all of us try to troubleshoot what's still going on with these asthma plans. Um, if everybody is done there, I'm just conscious of time. I've got about five minutes. Um, uh, Melbourne Health Pathways. Everybody hopefully uses Melbourne Health Pathways. Uh, we always have to chat about it when we get here. This is Health Pathways. It is your information resource for asthma. I'll whiz through this one. Um, oh, I need to be able to share my... Here we go. So Health Pathways, um, you can uh, get the password and uh, the the login from your practice manager or from Health Pathways itself. That's the opening screen. You go down the, to... I'm not sure how the people can see different, but I'm still seeing your PowerPoint slides. Oh, are you? Oh. Uh, here, what if I do this? Uh, oh, sure. now... I can see the yeah. thunderstorm. Actually, no, yeah. Yeah, I can see the Health Pathways. Yeah, yeah. Health Pathways. Okay, yeah. right. Um, sorry, I have three screens, uh, not by choice. Um, so I get confused with it. Okay, so you can go down to... Um, child health here and then it will go down to respiratory child assessing respiratory presentations we want to go down to asthma in children there's acute asthma asthma in children and adolescents and wheeze in children one to five years if you click on here you will get a load of information management stepwise approach to asthma and the links and the resources when to refer everything you need to manage pediatric asthma we've gone over that a few times so i'll just pop that down now and move back um, to the last thing which was just a quick mention this has also come up in uh, our community of practice multiple times is allergy and thunderstorm asthma and uh, you may or may not be aware that it happened again to a much lesser extent on Melbourne Cup Day. There was thunderstorm asthma event. We were certainly flooded in primary care in our area with acute asthma, new asthmatics and a lot of allergy. Um, we don't have Danny here today, who is usually the uh, the 
all-knowing power on how many admissions we would have had and how it would have help, uh, affected the healthcare service. But I just wanted to know if anybody had any stories, um, any experiences from that event and any knowledge they could share. Kirsty, it's Narelle here. I know that there were... Um... Within 24 hours, there were 234, I think, uh, hospitalizations for people that day. So it was a 700% increase in the, that usual time of year. Right, okay. And um, Narelle, would you know, because um, Danny um, had previously talked a lot um, about the early warning systems. Catherine, you might know as well, um, having worked in the ED, were there any early warning systems for the hospitals were put in place? Um, were you prepared for it? Um, did it work the way we hoped it would? Did you have any experience of that or hear anything from the emergency department about that? Because, yeah, I believe just speaking to people on the floor that they were an increase, but we had enough capacity on that day to cover so they didn't need to call in extra people like the last one. Right. OK. Yeah, yeah. It certainly wasn't as busy. And something I saw more, which was interesting and maybe something to discuss at another time, but um, huge amount of allergy increases that I didn't see last time. So I, I, I've been on both events. Um, I need to take a day off next time. But um, yeah, um, several new presentations of asthma, people who weren't asthmatic presenting queasy, but far more allergies, periorbital edema, um, so swelling around the eyes and really quite severe allergic conjunctivitis um, to the adults and children, um, not responding to oral antihistamines to the point needing steroid, um, hives, um, all over body hives quite severely as well, not responding to oral antihistamine. And we see a lot of allergies at this time of year, but um, of the people who I saw during the day, there was a significant proportion of people with not our atopic patients coming in with significant um, allergic symptoms at the same time. Just wondering if anybody else had that experience. Any GPs in the area notice similar patterns? No, we're all, we're all quiet on the Western Front for that. OK, <laughs> we can defer to Danny's uh, knowledge and data collection next time he's here. <laughs> um, so I think moving on, that is um, the last bit of information. Uh, she's just going to wrap up for us. Great. So, um, Thanks. Uh, I hope hopefully you found the tonight's session useful. Uh, we really appreciate you making time uh, in your schedules to attend this, and we really want this to be a community of practice, which really means it should be driven by the people attending the meetings as opposed to us facilitators. So, uh, you any feedback to make it better or to better address the needs that of you, we would love. So please answer the survey questions and please uh, share with us what you think would make this a better uh, event. And um, also, and the survey questions have been just popped uh, in, sorry, the link to the survey has just been popped into the chat. So um, uh, that's good. And then also please stay up to date with ICAM News um, to keep up to date about uh, all things uh, ICAM and relate to this topic. And thank you again to our uh, presenters today for two great talks. I think they were both like good for professional learning and really good for like informing clinical management and changing things that uh, we'll do, we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's great when a talk can tick those two things off. So thank you for that.